Coming up on Mac Break Weekly, I have taken control of the studio from my remote lair on the East Coast. Uh, this time we're talking about two different PR kerfuffles that Apple has been involved in, two or three different legal actions they've been involved in. Yes, it's been a bit of a slow week, but we're also going to be talking about Apple TV and the brand new Apple Store in New York. Stay tuned. You'll probably enjoy it. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 276, recorded on December 6th, 2011. Two kerfuffles, three lawsuits, and a whistle. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by GoToMeeting. The holidays, bad weather, sick days, travel can keep you out of the office, but not from getting work done. For your free 30-day trial, visit GoToMeeting.com and use the offer code MacBreak. And by... Text Expander from Smile Software. Save time and effort with Text Expander by typing short abbreviations to insert long text snippets or graphics you frequently use into anything you write. For a free demo, visit smilesoftware.com slash MacBreak. And by Audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, go to Audible.com slash MacBreak. It's time for Mac Break Weekly. As you can see by my dramatic single, Leo is not here. He is off having adventures in the Europe land world. Uh, and Alex is also off having adventures, leaving me in charge. Please do not be distracted by the fact that I don't have a big evil genius chair behind me. I've been told that Pottery Barn will be sending my free chair in due time. But until then, I've got a really wonderful lineup of guests and co-hosts to talk about everything Mac and iOS this week, starting with representing the mighty West Coast of North America, Chris Breen of Mac World. Chris, how have you been doing? I have been doing very well, thank you. And thank you for calling out the West Coast. It's, it's lovely here and our power is back on, thankfully. <laughs> Electricity is a wonderful thing to have, isn't it? It's the kind of thing that you take for granted until you're without it for three days and your food has spoiled and you have no heat in, at which point you rush to the local Starbucks and order a generator so that the next time this happens, you rule the neighborhood. Starbucks, Starbucks has generators. generators? Exactly. Yes. with Caramel and 8,000 <laughs> additional unnecessary calories. Exactly right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I see. I, I know exactly what you mean there because after uh, after the hurricane, I was about power for a solid week, and the camping spirit goes away after the second or third day. The pioneer spirit leaves after day six, and after the seventh day of pulling back into your driveway of having to maintain an office inside a Dunkin' Donuts with Wi-Fi, twenty twenty-five minute drive away, going back to a completely dark house with absolutely no snacks and no creature comforts. You get very Lord of the Rings ish, and not the good kind of Lord of the Rings, the Sauron ish. <laughs> hey, look, hey, look, that land over there. I bet I could subjugate it and bend it to my will just because I'm evil. That's the sort of. Fortunately, on day eight, the power came back on. So, yes, I feel, feel very much for you. Uh, representing not quite the East Coast, but nearly the East Coast, Adam Angst of tidbits.com. Adam, how are you? From your, from your office from in the penthouse inland, suite so at the Washington Monument, I see. We're we're inland, so all those hurricanes miss us for the most part. <laughs> you just you just get the wonderful weather up there in Ithaca. Yeah, well, I, I can't say for much today, but uh, it's uh, it's actually Seattle weather today. It's about forty two degrees and foggy, um, so I'm I'm getting those flashback feelings from the ten years in Seattle. Uh, <laughs> I will say though that this fall has actually been truly gorgeous. So fifties and sixties in November is just plain strange. Oh wait, there's global warming. I forgot. <laughs> now, are you, are you citing global warming as a support of global warming or as a <laughs> denial of global warming? Because we can do that both ways when it's unseasonable. Well, see, in this particular case, it's hard to argue with really pleasant weather. So you're like, well, global warming, I, I could take it for a little while. As a, as, as a runner, I guess that means that like the months of extreme pain and misery, as opposed to the usual months of extreme discomfort and physical misery, uh, have been stretched, have been delayed for at least another three weeks. So you got to be happy about that, huh? Oh, well, you see, it's not even a matter of delaying them. If you miss the cross-country season, you've, you've, you've lost like weeks and weeks of running in snow and mud. <laughs> uh, and that's just, you know, I mean, you need some of it to, to maintain the cross country cred, but it, honestly, 30 degree racing in 30 degrees in water is not my idea of a good time. 
Ah, there you go. That's that's why that's why the rest of us have the Nintendo Wii cross country. So it's the exact same sense of achievement, only without that outside with the day ball thing. And representing the other rather extreme uh, East Coast of North America, we have Don McAllister. Don, thanks for coming in from uh, the, the the Atlant. You're the you're the West Co East Coast of the of Atlant of of, of the Atlantic uh, seaboard. Yes. Yeah, that's that's one way of putting it, I suppose. Yeah, welcome. From, hello from Europe. Yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm the only one who's not actually in the web. I mean, Paris is only uh, an hour's flight from here, but uh, I've not managed to get myself over to the web. I know that's where Leo is this week and uh, a few other people as well. But uh, thank you for inviting me on. It's uh, it's always good to be here on MapRate Weekly. Always glad to have you here. And again, we, we, we would like to extend to you the courtesy of being an honorary North American. Uh, so okay. you should be very, very pleased and proud by that. Uh, we're going to start <laughs> off with, well, actually, actually, maybe not so such an honor to be a North American, uh, because clearly only the United States of America can take a very, very odd little quirk of a beta personal voice assistant software <laughs> and turn it into a major network, 24 hours cable news uh, kerfuffle. Uh, now, uh, I, sh I should, I should, before I, before we start describing what this kerfuffle is, uh, I'm going to warn uh, all of everybody in our, everybody in, in around today that. This is potentially a highly, highly controversial topic. So by all means, don't say anything controversial that would cause us to be picked up by these same 24-hour cable news channels and turn this into the highest rated episode of any Twit podcast all year long. So I want to caution you, do not do anything controversial that would cause this show to be immensely profitable for all concerned. Now, with that, uh, with that concern, uh, yeah, some... Rather, well, can we call them silly? I will stop at saying calling calling them silly. Uh, journalists have noticed that uh, if you ask Siri on an iPhone 4S where I can get uh, abortion services, uh, Siri will not be able to find you. Said abortion services. And if you ask, "Hey Siri, why are you anti-abortion?" According to one of these news reports, Siri will say, "I just am," or "Just might." Now I'm going to hand it off to you, Adam, because I think you posted the definitive rebuttal to this on Tidbits uh, the other day. Uh, our, uh, but let me set it up for you. Should we be concerned about this political stance being taken by Apple and articulated through their built-in software, Adam? <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, yeah, the, 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 this, this, was, this was just ridiculous. I, I, I heard about it first because a friend of mine set, sent me email from moveon.org that he had gotten say, telling them, asking him to... Uh, uh, you know, go sign a petition about how telling Apple that they were, you know, really upset with Apple for being anti-abortion and, and how Siri was just saying, well, when asked if you were pro, you know, in favor of, uh, of abort, you know, against abortion, Siri just said, I just am. And I, I was just flabbergasted at the level to which people were, were taking this fairly basic, you know, sort of search and response thing and, and making Apple corporate policy out of it. I mean, I can't even get a straight answer out of Apple PR most of the time <laughs> as to work Apple corporate policy. And, and you expect you're going to get it out of Siri? So, yeah, it was, it was really quite shocking just how um, this caught on and, and really continued in the face of just uh, you know, people not realizing what could possibly be going on here. Yeah, I mean, also, if they'd asked the second question, realizing that I don't know, I just am, is one of the eight like canned responses that Siri hands up, or Siri hands up when you ask a Siri a question about itself. Uh, and there's, uh, Chris, is there, is there any other obvious reason why you know this allegation from Move On is kind of not quite correct, and maybe even, again, I'm being charitable by calling it silly, aren't I? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say asinine, but um, but that's you see that's, that's see that's that's why that, uh, unfortunately it's hard to be in the hosting chair because it's my job as host to say now what is your uh, Chris you're an expert on iOS what would be your assessment of the of this of this news report right and then, asinine counting on you uh, to say asinine <laughs> yes uh, it it's like these people have never conducted a Google search in their entire life <laughs> uh, and it, it requires that every so often you enter a search term and you end up with results that don't match what you're searching for and it's not because Google is out to change the world or has a political viewpoint it's just that you didn't conduct a very good search query so I don't know about you where you guys are on on the East Coast or, or how it is in Britain but I know around here we do not have places called abortions are us just doesn't work you that don't. way so well, well, well no. there's a trademark issue mostly there ah okay 
<laughs> it's the backwards R that's the problem. Oh, I see. So <laughs> if you talk to Siri and say, where can I find abortion services? It is not making a, a moral judgment. And it, it's, it's not saying, well, I don't, you know, I'm not sure that I agree with this, but rather it's looking up for very basic searches and says, I don't see the word abortions anywhere. <laughs> I tried this just saying family planning, and I still ended up with some very hazy results. So Google is better because if you were to type family planning in there, you'd probably get better results. But Siri searching is, is a little half-baked at this point. So no, they haven't conducted a web search. And two, they've never used Siri before because if they had, they would have understood that these are the kind of results you get every so often, asking for the most benign things. And yet it may still say, gee, I'm sorry, I don't know where you live. Or I, donut, what's donut? <laughs> So yeah, it, 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 tickles, it tickles me though, in, in that it sort of gives the impression that um, you know someone at Apple is actually carefully handcrafting all these responses. That <laughs> now, what, Jobs what might someone that. ask um, when they, they speak to Siri? Oh, I know. Let's let's uh, configure this. When obviously we all know, you know, it doesn't work like that. As Chris said, it's, it's basically a search engine, and it's it's uh, you know there are certain algorithms that it can respond to the certain information it has at hand. It's certainly not sort of uh, being filtered or, or, or handcrafted by uh, the team of people at Apple who are responsible for for putting together Siri responses. So it it strikes me as a, a little bit of, of people not quite understanding the technology really. Mm. Adam, you were about to say? Well, I was going to say that the thing that, that, that is interesting is, is that when you start poking hard at Siri, you can find some interesting holes that, that it's clearly not hand-coded because that's just dumb. Um, on the other hand, Siri is, is basically keyword matching off certain things and attempting to, to go to categories in a database. And so... You know, abortion service is just isn't a category in whatever series location-based database is, and yet there's something that's causing those keywords to trigger over to location stuff rather than just have Siri throw up its hands and say, "Okay, do a Google search." I really don't know, and so so there are some some limitations here that I think Apple can fix. I was I was honestly a little disappointed in Apple's response to the New York Times, where they kind of. Yeah, they kind of meekly said, oh, we're, we're so sorry. There's, there's still some kinks in the product because it's in beta. And, you know, that, what, what bugged me was is that that implies when it's finally released, it's going to be perfect. No, <laughs> it's still going to make these kind of mistakes. It, you know, there'll be different ones. I'm sure they'll fix that one. You know, they will hard code that one in there just to avoid the problem. But, but these, this is how these kind of database-driven search engine-like devices work. And it's always going to have something. And we've seen these kinds of problems crop up. I was, I was desperate. I couldn't find the reference. Maybe you, one of you guys remembers as well. But weren't there some issues with the, um, the computer, the uh, built-in user dictionaries in, in either Microsoft products or on the early, in the early in Mac OS X, like not having certain words or you know, providing certain kinds of... Uh, 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 suggestions to misspelled words and people, you know, extrapolating from that too. Yeah, it's it's, it's a little bit like uh, uh, like uh, uh, the those Nicolas Cage Treasure Hunter movies where, in order to hide a a fortune in gold, the founding fathers decide to instead of simply saying, "Oh, by the way, here's the message, here's where it's hidden," they decided to make it 81 layers deep to make sure that you'd have to follow exactly the right path to find the actual solution. But it does kind of raise an interesting point, though. Uh, when you're use Siri is not like any other search tool. When you're using Bing or Google, you know that you're the one who's filtering the responses yourself. All you're doing is plugging in keywords and getting a list of results that, that hit off those keywords. But conceivably, the way that you interact with Siri is to ask a human being a question and to expect and trust an answer. So I wonder how much thought and how much work goes in at Apple to process a question like, I think I may. I think I might have mixed my medications. I'm a little. My vision's a little bit blurry. What do I do? Do you do a keyword search off of that? Do you immediately send this person to the, the closest immediate care facility? Do you treat it like a potential suicide? Uh, and I know these are heavy things, but it's an example of when someone is as, when someone comes to expect that the same search utility that can that can show you where do I find a burrito at this hour in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to have the answers to any question that you might have, especially when it's something that this is the closest thing that I have to me in an emergency situation, and I'm not. I yeah. don't necessarily have the ability to type out a long response. So well, what, what and, role do you think Apple should take? 
Well, that's a that's a really really interesting question, and uh, I com- was having a conversation on Google Plus about this. And one guy, actually Steve Dorner, author of Eudora, um, way back when, commented that a, he, a friend of his who had once had to call nine one one during a break in in his house said, "It turns out to be really hard to dial nine one one when you're freaked out." Mm-hmm. That you know the whole you know. People saying, oh, well, who would use Siri in an emergency situation? Well, I don't know. It seems to me that, you know, you're, gonna, you're not thinking very clearly in an emergency situation. Who knows what you're going to do? And you're certainly not going to be doing <coughs> a, a, a clever, you know, well-done Google, you know, well-done search. <laughs> so I do think Apple has some, you know, some work to do there to figure out, you know, what kinds of uh, queries or what kinds of... Uh, I don't know if they can do intonation or any or, or sort of be able to to de- try to determine if there's some you know like the person if there's emotion or a person is scared or something like that, and to really I don't know hard code that off to some kind of you know do you need me to call emergency services um, and then you know send that to the phone app for a 911 call um but that's a product that's a that's an issue apple has to be talking about and they have to be thinking about because it will come up mm. chris do you know anything special about the series uh back end that would make that easier or harder i mean one of the things that occurs to me is that maybe there's a trap door or fail safe that says that at some point siri can uh, the, the the server can understand that this is a really complicated question. I don't understand it. Why don't I kick it to an actual human being? It'll take an extra eight seconds to get a response, but maybe that'll fine-tune things better. Is such a thing even possible, or would it even violate uh, the privacy agreement that uh, the user has with Apple if it did that? Well, that would be my concern, and I think maybe that would be Apple's as well, is do you – I mean, people. I think when people use Siri, as much as it has a human-ish voice to it, I think we all understand that there is a computer, there's some kind of technology working behind there. I think people would be concerned if whatever they were asking for went to a real human being, that somehow they could scratch out a note better than something else could keep track of you, which is silly. Um, But I do think it would be a privacy issue for a lot of people thinking, you know, this is, I mean, we already have enough issues about privacy in these devices, and we're going to talk about that later, that I think when you put a human being in there, it makes people uncomfortable because this is a very personal device. And when you have a query that you're sending, which may be a little embarrassing, like you're looking for a birth control or something at a certain time, or you're, you're concerned about a health issue, do you really want a, a human to have access to that query? And even though they may provide you information, I think people would feel rocky about that. Yeah. Well, you mentioned another. Uh, we have a. This is a two kerfuffle show. Uh, Apple was lucky enough to have a second kerfuffle uh, drop in their lap last week uh, when a kerfuffle involving user privacy of the iPhone. This is the second user privacy kerfuffle that uh, the iPhone has had in the past year and a half, uh, starting with when it turned out that uh, backups of the iPhone were record were dumping a very clearly a, 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 a loose but still informative log of where this phone has been uh, over the past X months. Uh, Apple had to respond to that and do a correction. Last week's kerfuffle. Uh, had to do with a piece of software called Carrier IQ uh, that a researcher found on HTC phones that seemed to have been given logs that he was able to generate uh, diagnostically uh, a piece of software located on the phone installed by the carrier that could uh, get access to URLs that you've been using to- cell towers that this uh, that this phone had been connecting to even the text of text messages that you have been sent seemingly a lot more information that a random piece of software you'd think should be able to uh, collect from a phone, particularly one that's super top secret. Um, the company that makes Carrier IQ handled it, I think, in a way that almost any PR person would say was exactly the right way to handle it if you want to send business away from their current PR person and towards something comp- someone competent like themselves. Uh, they decided to attack this researcher, uh, bring <laughs> lawyers right down in his head, <laughs> try to legally force him to retract his statements about what Carrier IQ software was doing on this HTC phone, and also 
release a statement that they themselves had written about how wrong, 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 wrong he was about what the CARE IQ software was doing. He ran, of course, directly to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is the uh, proves its metal and its usefulness to the internet community more, more and more with each passing month. Uh, gave him an adequate defense, and so he came out back with a YouTube video that even more clearly explained: Here is what happens when I touch this button on the phone. Hey, look, it's logging that keystroke. Here's what, look, here's what happens when I do a web search. Hey, look, Carrier IQ software is locking this thing, and maybe it also has hooks possibly to the outside. Uh, and it turned out, so this turned into a huge problem for lots and lots of handset makers. It didn't take long for a researcher to discover that there is there are at least references to Carrier IQ on the iPhone uh, that caused a lot of people who, I think their first, in the Apple community, their first reaction was, well, you know that this is going to happen on an Android phone where they can put anything they <laughs> want and the user doesn't have, to, uh, but, 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 uh, you, uh, there is a hook to carry your IQ on the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, a little bit, a little bit patched, a little bit dehydrated. <laughs> uh, Chris, I, I, I think that you probably know exactly what we're talking about here and what Apple's, what, what the actual extent of the quote problem quote was for at least Apple for the software. Well, Apple has said that since iOS five has been out, they are no longer tracking through Carrier IQ. Um, now, when we say no longer tracking, were they ever tracking? Well, that's you're right. That's I'm sorry. Let me back up. That carry RQ and the other carriers will all say, you know, that's not what this is for. What we're using it for is to see how the phone is performing, um, what kind of cell uh, coverage we're getting, when apps are crashing. So these and it's all anonymous. It's not you know we don't care that you've texted this. We can't track SMS messages or phone calls or any de any details of documents you may have created on this device. Um, rather, this is very uh, very general and isn't targeted at you. Apple, however, has said with iOS 5 that in, in their diagnostic information, this data is not included. Also, you have the option on an iOS device to not enable diagnostic, and, and it's not on by default. You have to actually switch it on. So it's, um, Apple came out with this defense. Carrier IQ, again, is saying that's not what's happening here. The carriers are also saying, even in their secret documents, are saying this isn't really a problem. This is a PR problem. Um, and certainly it's something they're going to want to go back and look at, as will the carriers. I think the broader issue for people, as I was saying earlier, is that these are very personal devices. We understand that that Google is keeping track of some of the of our of our searches and they're using that information to sell to advertisers. Facebook is doing the same kind of thing. But I think we feel so protected in such a large crowd that it isn't quite such a big deal. I personally, I'm creeped out by Facebook and I won't belong to it, but a lot of other people don't mind. But when it's your own phone and it's information that you personally have brought in, this I think has, has uh, set off the spidey tingle for a lot of people where they there's think, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. There's Adam. an interesting, Adam. interesting aspect to that, Chris, which is I think there's a difference between what Google and Facebook and the like are often doing, which is that they are they're sort of one level removed mm -hmm. where they're tracking, um, they're sort of looking at what you do, whereas at least in, in some of the situations of Carrier IQ, it was recording your actual words and thoughts. And that feels to me a little different. So with, yeah. with, you know, with Google, you, sort of, you know that they sort of know where you're going and things like that, but there isn't that sense that they're actually reading you know, the URLs and, you know, and, and looking at the web forms on the websites you go to and things like that. Whereas with Carrier IQ, the fact that, that this guy could say, look, I type in this text message and here it is in my log, you know, whether or not the carriers were actually using that feature of Carrier IQ, that it was there at all is really freaky. Yeah. Well, and, and, and too, I, oh, sorry, sorry, Chris. I'm sorry, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I think that, that in, in addition to it being very personal, I think that a lot of people have the sense that it's inevitable that we're going to be tracked and we're going to and that companies like Facebook and and other instances are pushing the boundaries of what they can get away with. How much can we pull from you? What can we do to our privacy settings to make them as least private as possible until a governing body steps in and says you can't do that. Oh, sorry. And then they back off and then wait and then they push it again to see how it goes. And then we have the, anyone who would protect us from that, which would be our legislators, one, 
haven't a clue what's going on because they seem to be completely stupid about technology. And to move so slowly when the industry is moving so quickly that they can't seem to close enough doors where and we've lost this this moral compass of how much is too much? At what point do we say, no, you can't have access to this information? Yes, it's good for your business. Yes, it may even be good for your customer in certain instances, but it has to stop at some point. Well, yeah, let's, the let's Fair Trade Commission actually uh, slapped, uh, uh, basically had, a, uh, had to uh, slap uh, Facebook around a little bit last week, uh, making them, uh, calling their privacy controls actively deceptive. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very long and entertainment PDF you can find on the FTC.gov site. Uh, but it's not simply, oh, well, we don't think you're secure enough. And well, we'd like you to, we'd like you to look at this, Mr. Facebook. It was, no, here's point by point every way that you have basically hosed over all of your users by lying, excuse me, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really <laughs> Pretty frank <laughs> language. It, it's, it's very, it's very, it is, it is very frank language. They, they're saying no, you are actively deceptive. You are telling them that by switching this privacy setting to this setting, you're making things more secure. When in fact, you are actually causing them to expose even more information, uh, just squirting it out of a different uh, gun port than before. Uh, so I think that we're definitely going to see some blowback from this. Already, there was the inevitable announcement of a class action suit against pretty much every handset maker that was using Carrier IQ, uh, including Apple. So uh, when this is set settled in three years time, uh, see if you can plan on how you're going to use your 12 cent iTunes credit that you're going to get uh, as part of your settlement package. But maybe we're seeing uh, an era in which these things are getting so public and at least this is, a, this is an area in which if you scare people, at least it get, makes them aware that of all the information they're exposing just by carrying one of these things around in their pockets 24 hours a day. I mean, with Apple, Apple's problem was not necessarily that they were collecting location information that was identifiable to the person, but that they weren't securing it properly so that if some, a third party, be it a bad guy or even a person in law enforcement, decided that, hey, if, if I, I know that this person has an iPhone, if I can get access to their computer for about 10 minutes, I can download a complete log of vaguely where they've been. So if they said that they're, they've, never, they've never been to, uh, to, to Oregon, I can prove, well, no, actually, I think that this phone says you have been to Oregon. So that's something you don't want your phone telling you people about. Actually, I, really, I do think... Oh, sorry, done. Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, I do think that Apple have that. dodged a huge no. PR bullet um, with it not being in iOS 5. And, and the timing of the iOS 5 release and this story actually coming to light was, uh, I think, has been pretty good for Apple. Had it, uh, had they still have included it in iOS 5, um, I think the story would have, would be, you know, an order of magnitude greater than it already is. And it's quite scary as it is now, but uh, had Apple have been found to have it on their current phones as well, I think it would have been blown up uh, quite a bit more than it is now. But it, it is really scary. I, I mean, the, the things that the guy was actually showing on, on the phone, um, you know, even doing calls to Google using HTTPS, it actually intercepted that before it actually went to Google. So you could see all the strings and everything and, you know, text messages coming in. It, it's not so much that, well, it is bad that it's doing it, but my concern is what's happening with the data. You know, is it actually getting off the phone? When it does go off the phone, if it does go off, you know, what are they actually doing with it then? And is it properly anonymized? Yeah, I was, when, I, when I wrote about this last... Uh, go ahead, Ed. go ahead. Ed. I was just going to say, um, I don't know, I don't know the, quite the details, but my understanding is the EU has very much uh, more more stringent privacy requirements in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the U.K. participates in those, but but do you see a different attitude towards this in, in England? You know, I, other than the tech press, I've not really seen much about it, to be honest. Um, it's been fairly low key, I think, from this side of the pond. I don't know whether or not that's because it's still there are still things to be proven yet, but. Uh, as far as I'm aware, anyway, from from the the sources that I sort of check, it's mainly been in the tech, uh, the tech news, and not so much in the in the general news as yet. So so, it, but if something like this came out, um, mm -hmm. which would be in violation of the EU privacy requirements, would that be you know cause for huge huge hullabaloo and you know the EU you know hammering companies in a really big way? Or I mean, is it is it different, or are we just sort of you know are we <laughs> does the EU do this stuff better, or are we simply uh, all kind of uh, <laughs> under the gun here? They, they they do take it very seriously, I think, but uh, whether or not they do it better than other places, I'm not too sure. But you know, mm -hmm. if something is proven, uh, they they can make quite uh, quite quite stringent demands on companies. Yeah, I think that I think that's going to show how important it is that companies respond to these things very very quickly, learn from their mistakes, and establish a good track record. Apple is generally trustworthy because although that location information problem from uh, earlier uh, was pretty embarrassing, now I think that when it, the first time I learned that when you turn <laughs> Siri off, one of the first things that the phone does is delete all logs of everything you've been doing with Siri. 
uh, so that at least there's no information left on your phone when you electively decide to turn it off. I think that has to be at least an after effect of all the PR problems that they had uh, earlier on. Uh, we are going to take a break and thank one of our sponsors. I'm going to hand things over to our grand poobar and minister of information, especially advertising related information, Leo Laporte, with a message from GoToMeeting. Andy, if you, if you don't mind, I'd just like to interrupt for a moment to talk a little bit about GoToMeeting. Go to meeting. Uh, you know, the holidays are here, bad weather, uh, sick days, and just travel. You don't want to necessarily be at the office the whole time, right? Uh, maybe you want to go to Paris. I don't know. Well, that's where go to meeting is fantastic because no matter where you or your, or your colleagues or your clients are, you can meet with them, even an impromptu meeting, just over the internet using go to meeting. Yes, go to meeting. It's online meeting software. It's do, it's done right. It's fast. It's secure. It's easy for you and even easier for your clients and colleagues and I like that. Um, you get screen sharing and also with HD faces this new feature. Uh, those of you who are uh, meeting from desktops can actually show video. Everybody gets to see it, but you need a desktop computer to show the video. And now with go to meeting, you can attend a meeting from the iPad, we mentioned that before, now from the iPhone and the Android phone too. That means literally you're on the move and you're at a meeting, you're getting things done. It's fantastic. Collaborate in real time. It's great for training. It's great for product reviews. It's great for demos and sales presentations. Uh, we use it all the time just to confer, just for updates. Go to me. I want you to try it free right now. now here's the deal. The app is free in the, um, in the uh, Apple um, uh, App Store, the iTunes App Store, or in the Android Marketplace. Just download that app and then get your uh, copy of go to meeting free for 30 days by going to go to meeting.com clicking the try it free button and the promo code is mac break that's go to meeting.com uh, click the orange try it free button right there and then use the offer code mac break 30 days free 30 days free that's for holding a meeting and of course anybody can attend a meeting for free again on your ipad your iphone your android phone it's just amazing go to meeting.com use the offer code mac break we thank go to meeting and citrix for sponsoring Mac Break Weekly. Now back to the boys and Mac Break Weekly. Andy? Thank you, Leo. Even when reporting from the Matrix, he is still authoritative and impressive. Um, actually, uh, last week, uh, those those of us who are, this is the season in which Apple the Apple News tends to center more on lawsuits than actual products shipped. Uh, so there was a cool piece of news last week that uh, I think a lot of you uh, have already heard about. Uh, and Apple's ongoing fight against Samsung, trying to insist that hey, Samsung stole a lot of our technology, violates a lot of our patents, and so they shouldn't be allowed to sell phones and tablets in the God fearing parts of the world or the universe uh, in larger sense. Uh, the judge that uh, handled the case last week declined to issue an injunction against Samsung uh, and published a, published her decision. Uh, unfortunately, and this is the, where the comedy comes in, uh, it was published as a PDF in which certain sections were redacted. They were blacked out, which is sort of a common thing if there is... Uh, what might be termed technological secrets for a certain number of months, perhaps those things are going to be blocked from the official record until they can be cleared out again. Unfortunately, whoever did it decided to simply use the simple feature that just leaves the text intact, but simply covers up with a graphical box uh, that the that the reader software has to then use. And it took about 0.3 seconds for every million different tech blogs to realize if you simply cut and paste it into a new document, you can read the entire decision with all the blacked out parts in their full glory. Uh, and there are a couple of interesting bits of Apple news uh, that, that we're able to be extracted from this. Uh, oh, by the way, first kudos go to TheVerge.com, uh, Josh's new uh, new tech blog. Uh, kudos to him. Uh, but uh, one interesting tidbit is that Apple does, or at least, at least on one occasion, has licensed some of their patents and some of their iOS technology to other handset makers. It The uh, ruling mentions the uh, a scrolling behavior, which I think the, the Verge identified as that when you scroll on an iPhone to the, a long, long list of something, you get to the end, you get the sort of elastic effect where it sort of stretches up and reveals the uh, linen background, then snaps back down. That was uh, years and years of, of of people dying, just like in the Manhattan Project, who unleashed the secrets of the elastic bottom uh, and then releasing it. Uh, and that now Apple has licensed this to other uh, manufacturers, saying that Samsung did not license this, and that was part of the problem. Uh, the other Another tidbit that it revealed is that, according to Apple itself, Apple itself does not believe that 
uh, Samsung, these Samsung devices, though they do infringe on uh, Apple's patents and uh, and copyrights, they don't believe that it will steal any uh, any sales away from iPhones. That will just simply cannibalize other Android phones instead. So that actually would work better for Apple's uh, Apple's uh, uh, business practices than anybody else's. Uh, is this news? So have we, Chris? Have you ever heard of Apple licensing their own technology out to other handset makers? No, I haven't, but I, I'm not surprised. I think there's an awful lot that Apple does to make money and, and mm -hmm. makes deals with other people. I mean, because Samsung isn't only a company that is competing with Apple. They're also Apple's partner in, in some other ways for components. So I could see that there could very well be a friendly relationship in parts of their business where they say, yeah, look, you know, we need to lock out uh, anybody else from using these components that you're providing. So... In the meantime, if you'd like to just take this binder into that other room for the next five minutes, and we'll just conveniently look over here. And if that feature were to show up on some of your devices, oh, aren't you clever to have found a different way to do that than we do. Uh, so, no, I'm, I'm not terribly surprised that Apple is doing this. And also, I, it makes sense to me that it's going to cannibalize Android devices rather than Apple devices. I, I still think that in terms of the iPhone and the iPad and, and iOS devices, that's really, it's Apple and everybody else. If you want the cool device, you're going to get the Apple device. And if you want something, if you want to stroll in and say, well, I need a smartphone, but I only want to pay 40 bucks or I want it free, they'll say, yeah, well, here's this thing here. And they're going, oh, good, I'll use that. Thank you very much. <laughs> but Adam, is this? Do you think this is a little bit against Apple's character? They've always been talking about how protective they are about their own technology. Also, at least these two different tidbits are tell kind of a different story uh, about what Apple's public position has always been about how we're we're the little guys and we're being attacked by Android. They want to crush us. They want to kill us. And we're so we're like lost little lambs tethered in the middle of a game preserve. <laughs> Who will protect us? But the United States government. Uh, do you, is is this like sort of out of character, or is this just really? Un distressingly in character for Apple to have one uh, one set of opinions inside the courtroom and another set of expressions outside the courtroom. Well, uh, yeah, I, I do think the whole, you know, Apple is, uh, is this weak little company that needs all the protection it can get. Um, maybe a stance that some lawyers are attempting to try take, but, you know, given the size and the power and dominance of Apple in general, I think everyone's just laughing at it as, a, as, <laughs> as an approach. Um, and I don't think Apple believes it. I think Apple is pretty confident of their ability to crush the other kids in... Oh, wait, no, that, was, that was from a while ago. Um, <laughs> the, so, they, yeah, Apple, Apple I think, is, is you know, confident they can compete, and they're going to compete in every aspect of the business world. And some of that includes filing lawsuits, even some of which may be frivolous or which you don't expect to win, which you, you expect to be using as delaying mm -hmm. tactics or to increase cost of goods for the competition. What I guess I find most frustrating about this when you, you first ask Chris, you know, is this news? I don't think it is news. I think it's not news in exactly the way that so much of what appears in the news media is not news. It's gamesmanship. It's all about the game. It has nothing to do with, is the iPad a good device? Is, the, you know, is this particular Android tablet a good device, a better device, a worse device? That's information. That's inf interesting stuff. The news as who's ahead right now, who's made this, this strategic move to, to, to block the other guy, that's just, I mean, it's football, it's soccer, it's basketball. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with reality. It's just taking it one step apart and turning it into a game. Mm -hmm. And it bugs me in politics and it bugs me in the, in, the, in the business world as well. It happens, but that doesn't mean it's what we should be focusing on. But Don, I, I, want, I want Don to come in on this. There's, there's the weird and sort of distressing for an Apple fan realization that uh, Android phones are getting less easy to make fun of with each passing year. Now they're still now they're still pretty hysterical. I don't want to I don't want to say there's no comedy to be found in, in the Android platform, uh, particularly as the screens get larger and larger. But I've held a couple of different Android phones that I thought were pretty darn good. And if I really did want for uh, a phone that could double as a 4G mobile hotspot when I travel, or if I had a certain affection for a larger screen, I, I'm not quite ready to buy a Kindle Fire or something with a larger tablet size uh, yet. 
but I do want a little bit of extra screen real estate so I can watch movies and read books a little more comfortably. That's kind of attractive. I mean, is, is, is Apple at least trying to, maybe they're trying to be a little bit more proactive for not the phones that are coming out today, but the phones that might come out a year or two from now, in your opinion? I don't know. I think, I mean, Apple are a strategic player. I mean, they, they you know, it's, it's really not the next six months. It's the next three or four years that they're looking down mm -hmm. the track. So, um, you know, and we've seen this with, like the you know, the bulk memory purchases and stuff. You know, they sort of wipe the market clean and, and take up certain um, you know, bits of kit they use for their, their applications and their, their equipment. But there's such a strategic play. You've got to think that lots of these uh, licensing deals are being done, you know, uh, for a purpose. And I've always said as well, I, I do believe, and I think Chris said this as well, that there are iPhone users and there's everybody else. And if someone wants um, an iPhone, they will go and they will either buy an iPhone online or they'll go to a store and they'll seek out an iPhone. They'll do the research and they'll buy the device that they want. And then there are the people who just want to buy a phone. And, you know, they'll just go into the store and say, right, what's the latest and greatest phone? Uh, I don't really want to pay a premium price. You know, I'm not interested in the iPhone because that's really expensive, you know. And, and, and basically they will be sold an Android device, which m meets their budget and their requirements. So they're getting better and better and better. But I, I really don't see that being Android fans and, and Apple fans, you know, iPhone and Android fans. I, I think that the two quite different communities. Um, and it, it's only really the... I hate the word fanboy, but, you know, someone who appreciates the Apple product and the Apple ecosystem or has, you know, the rest of the components that make up the Apple ecosystem, the Apple TV for AirPlay or, you know, they have a Mac or they have an iPad, you know, they will polarize towards getting an iPhone. And, and no matter really what happens on the Android side, I, I don't think um, any of the Android manufacturers could actually make a single device that would sort of tempt someone away who's already heavily invested in Apple and, and has Apple sensibilities to sort of moving across. I, I think really Android is just mopping up the rest of the market for those people who aren't interested in the iPhone. Mm. But Apple has a lot to protect. I mean, the, it's, it's incredible the amount of reach and influence that Apple has through the iTunes store that they uh, the, 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 they're the dominant music retailer from, on almost any, any category you can name uh, that they have such a dominant app uh, infrastructure, but that they still, those are just, all those services and all the software is, are just tools that they use to sell hardware, which is where they make all their money from. So if somebody ever cracks the code and figures out a way to make hardware that's, uh, hardware and an ecosystem that's so attractive that maybe the, someone's next phone won't be an iPhone, maybe it will be a Windows Phone 7.5 or Windows Phone 8. Uh, I've had one of those uh, for the past couple weeks to play with them. That's pretty darn good. I mean, Apple might have more to protect in the coming years uh, uh, than they might seem at first blush. Yeah, I think they've they've got a, a huge lead though. I mean, they've got a couple of years and everybody else, and that makes I think that's a that's a telling difference. Now, in a couple of years' time, when people have had a chance to catch up, perhaps there might be more of an, a level playing field. But in that time, again, you know, Apple will progress. Apple will bring out new more devices and. Uh, and, and do additional things with the, with the ecosystem and the back end as well. So I, the way I see it really is that it, it is a catch-up race at the moment for other manufacturers trying to catch up and trying to leapfrog Apple. And it's that leapfrogging that people don't quite seem to be able to do. They, they, they can just about catch up and then, we'll, you know, Apple's off again with, with the next release or the next product cycle or whatever. And I, th I think, you know, vendors are really struggling to try and leapfrog Apple to bring the next greatest and, great and, and best thing out. I think now, the see, company that I would actually look at is, uh, is in fact, Amazon, because Amazon has the ecosystem, and they understand the concept of lock-in using DRM, which everyone, all the publishers and, you know, video companies want, but they use the DRM to lock you into their ecosystem. And uh, that's something that, uh, that Apple has taken huge advantage of as well. Uh, Amazon uses a different approach, spreading their apps and, and, and uh, services across many platforms, whereas Apple requires you to buy Apple hardware. But uh, it's, it's nonetheless an interesting competition. And it reminds me a little bit of how Apple and Google and Microsoft all somehow compete while still using completely different business models. And so it's these, you know, these weird competitions where no one's going head to head and everyone's making their money in different places. And yet they're all still right there, um, you know, at the end of the day, trying to get the same customer to do the same different things. Yeah. So, you know, Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, they're all in the fray now. And Facebook actually is, uh, is I think, coming on fast in that, in that category as well. Yeah. 
in many ways, it seems as though Amazon is the not only not only are they very similar to Apple and in, in that they've spent so much time uh, pretty uh, inventing not just hardware but also an infrastructure around it and an arc an ecosystem around it. But in some ways, they're actually the complete opposite of Apple in that Apple is willing to not really make much money on their software services as long as they can make huge, huge profits, markups on their hardware. Amazon, for every teardown that's been done on the Kindle Fire tablet, uh, has that they are barely breaking even, if not losing a couple of dollars on each one of these $199 tablets. And yeah. clearly, Amazon's plan is to uh, take a small loss on the hardware, give, give away the, 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 the razors and uh, make profit on the blades and all the, on the software. Um, the fire has been out long enough now that the usual analysts that have their usual reports to assure the usual people uh, that they know what they're talking about when it comes to analyzing the tablet industry are coming out with their reports and an analysis of the Kindle Fire. Um, the consensus seems to be that the Kindle Fire is actually going to help the iPad. We have a report, I think it was from J.P. Morgan. I'm afraid that my, my note here is a little bit sloppy. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the money quote was that uh, Apple will continue to skim the cream off the top of the tablet market. Well, they'll, they'll always get the high profit, high margin device for people who have 500 bucks to spend or want a premium product. Amazon is going to take pretty much everybody else, people who are on a budget or don't have the, the greatest expectations yeah. out of a tablet. Uh, and that essentially this totally upends the rest of the Android market because there's just no room for anybody to squeeze. Um, one is saying that, uh, uh, from Evercore Partners, a guy named Robert Sear is predicting that Fire will have half of the entire Android tablet market by 2010. That could be more than 400 tablets, by the way. Uh, no, just <laughs> kidding. Uh, it's, it seems as though they're on track to... Uh, uh, I believe Amazon has already sold uh, said that uh, uh, they've, they've exceeded their own expectations. They're still not uh, uh, issuing any actual, uh, uh, any actual numbers on sales, uh, but that's pretty much uh, Kindle's way. Amazon's way. Um, they're also another analyst is saying that they've had their own co their co own conversations with Apple executives, and that Apple, excuse me, according to his report, that he believes that Apple is seeing things in exactly the same way that uh, Kindle is the Kindle Fire is valuable to Apple as a disruptive force that keeps the rest of the Android tablet market completely off balance. Uh, so I guess it's you know it's the it's the classic definition of keeping your friends close and your enemies even closer. Uh, yeah. is it, is it, how, many, how many of us actually have fire tablets or no, no one who has one yet? I, I do. Um, I have we one. had to get, yeah. If, I don't. It, it was interesting. Don't you have one? Don't get them in the UK yet. They're still not. Yeah, in the not oh, that's UK, right. Yeah. Yeah, just the uh, the the, the thing I'm, I found I'm surprised that you should have flown out here and bought one just so you could do a screencast <laughs> about it. It's like it's yeah, like you're, you're what, it's every every time because you're you're so prolific and doing such great screencast videos about everything. Every time there's a product that like you haven't done a screencast on, it must be like watching like <laughs> a big bin loaded with money on a conveyor belt. You just have to sort of watch it like pass you by. At the airport. Yeah, well, it's killing me. I mean, we, we still haven't got iTunes Match, so, you know, that, that's killing me now. And I've been asked several times, when's the screencast for iTunes Match coming out? And unfortunately, until they roll it out to the UK, I can't really do it, unless I do sort of come over for a weekend and do a quick screencast over there. You know? <laughs> but uh, no, we're still, still waiting on the fire. It didn't quite tempt me enough to uh, jump across the pond to come and get one, I must admit. Oh, well. Okay. Uh, Adam, what, so what have you been thinking about it? Well, I mean, first of all, you know, it's 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 really interesting because you kind of look at it and you're like, how do I turn this silly thing on? And there's yeah. this tiny they, they little the button in the corner down. here. <laughs> um, but the, the the thing that I find the most interesting, it's hard to get into the picture too. Oh, there we go. Um, I'm having trouble with the reverses. Uh, any event, the thing I find interesting about it, I was just talking with someone today who, who puts a lot of thought into e-readers and iPads and tablets and whatnot. And he was saying, you know, what about the question of, do you need an iPhone, an iPad, a laptop, and a Kindle Fire? And I'm like, you know, the only two things that I can see the Kindle Fire as doing exclusively are the Amazon uh, Instant Video, Amazon Prime-based Instant Videos, and the free book loaning. That everything else that Amazon does, you can get in the Kindle app. And, you know, the, and, you know, and for the most part, if you can do Amazon Instant Video, you can do Netflix on the iPad, you're not getting a huge amount of difference there. So it was an interesting um, thought process. It was like, no, I, I, you know, I can see why you might want and I fire as well if you really like the the form factor or whatnot. But if you were traveling, you'd leave the fire home. I mean, why would you bother? It's just not going to do anything for what that extra weight, the extra you know battery charger, you know all of those things that you have to put up with to bring more technology. So, you know, I don't think it's a bad device. 
um, but I find it mm, honestly a little uninspired. Uh, it, it does some things well. It's very good for, for its media, but it, you know, it, I don't grab it when I'm thinking about doing anything the way I do think of grab the iPad or the iPhone. Mm. Chris, what have, you, what have your experience been? I use it for reading um, quite a bit. And I, I think this is one of these devices. You, you try to think how many different ways can you squeeze a device into a certain pocket? Where as before we had the iPhone and then we had a laptop. You think, well, do I really need a, a middle device? Well, yeah, the iPad end, ends up working that way. So now I've squeezed it down even more. So now I've got my iPhone, I've got my iPad, and now I have my Kindle Fire. And so I use the Kindle Fire for reading because I have I also got a Kindle Touch to see what that experience was like. And I have to say, I'm not a big fan of e-ink, and, and largely because it's not backlit. And I know a lot of people love that, but I don't read outdoors very often, and uh, the lighting here isn't always good. So I find it difficult to read unless I have that direct light or I have a, 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 a book light on it, and that's, it's awfully reflective on the touch. So I find this is good because, and this may be just the dumbest reason to spend 200 bucks, <laughs> but I find this thing too heavy to yeah. read for a couple of hours in bed. And so you have to hold it with two hands. If you try to do it with one hand, then your, your wrist gets sore, and that's no good. And it's, books look great on this thing, but for some reason, I think it's worth 200 bucks to be able to hold this thing in one hand, have a nice backlit display. Okay, I don't want to take it outside because it's too reflective, but inside where I do the majority of my reading, it's great. I do like the video streaming on it. I kind of like it for all the reasons that Apple or that Amazon calls it a Kindle for all the media reasons. Where I don't like it is when I try to treat it like an iPad and I find it slow, unresponsive. I tap things and they don't re re respond the way I want. And the screen size. So Andy, you and I talked about comic apps for this on Twitter. And I, I finally got the one that you recommended, which was Copycat, I think. And I find yeah. the screen size too small for comics. Yeah. I have to scroll around like six times on a page to see what's going on. Whereas on this device, I only have to scroll twice. I can see the top of the page. I can see the bottom of the page. If it's a two-page spread, I can easily move back and forth between the two of them. Yeah. So as a media yeah. reader, I think it's great. As a tablet, not so much. It really, does point out, it really does point out the importance of uh, media companies and having to restructure all of their content for these devices. One of the things I liked the least about the Fire, and this is the, one of the most negative parts of my review of it, was that uh, they gave me this, – this was, this was, these were magazines that Amazon had handpicked supposedly because they thought that it would show off the, the, the fire in the, in the best possible light. Uh, and so they, uh, they gave, gave me certain Condé Nast uh, publications, magazines to read uh, on the, that were preloaded on the, on the fire. And they're all just like PDFs, like hard encoded PDFs that I would have to zoom and scroll around and pinch and, pinch and stretch. And this is on a device that's not necessarily terrible. It's not, you wouldn't call it liquid fast at scrolling and, and, and pinching mm -hmm. and zooming. Um, then about a week later, uh, Barnes & Noble came out with their Nook tablet, which uh, feels a lot zippier. I can't tell, I can't say whether the processor is actually faster or what the clock speed is, but it certainly feels a lot faster. But the magazines that, uh, not only the ones that they gave me, but the ones that I bought on looked up, looked for and uh, bought on my own, uh, they have been completely reformatted. You get a, a version of People magazine that's been reformatted for seven inch screens and you have to do this for, excuse me, the publishers have to do this really for every piece of content they want to move on to this. I think that one of the reasons why the fire has been dinged so correctly uh, on its periodicals and its newspapers is because it's a, almost a painful experience on a seven inch screen. So in that sense, when Steve Jobs is talking about how, oh no, seven inch, do we try to seven inch tablets? They don't work. They're terrible. They're useless for the sort of media. You know, if people don't adjust, then that's exactly right. Adam, you're about to say. Hey, one, one thing I was going to say, Andy, in response to uh, Chris's comment, um, I agree with the, uh, um, with the problem with, you know, sort of holding the iPad in bed. But what I've discovered is that I have this, this zero chroma case that I, my iPad is, in, or iPad is in, and it just has this nice little pop-out, gosh, it's hard to get anything into the picture here, um, <laughs> you know, a nice pop-out stand. And I actually, when I was testing the, the Kindle Fire, I was watching video on it. But in fact, I tend to watch video... Um, 
being a high energy person while I'm stretching or working out or something like that. And I find that the combination of the iPad and the zero chroma case so that I can actually pick it up and move it around as I turn over to do a different stretch or a different, a different uh, exercise or something like that to be really useful. I tried it on the Kindle Fire and it was tremendously frustrating because I kept having to try to find something to lean it on. <laughs> and so, and in bed, same thing, you know, that it's constantly sliding around and everything, whereas the nice, having the nice stand on the iPad holds it in place right where I want to be able to look. Yeah, I have to say that with the iPad, I mean, I do read uh, on the iPad in, in bed, and what I tend to do is just use the, just the standard smart cover, uh, fold it down into its triangular formation, and then just plunk it on my chest, and that's fine, because I sort of, you know, I'm not sort of sitting up reading, I'm sort of laying down, sort of half propped up, and, and that seems to be okay. I noticed there's, there's a new uh, Kickstarter project, um, actually there's yes. two Kickstarter <laughs> projects which are interesting. One, one is a, a docking station for the MacBook Air, which looks fantastic, perhaps we'll talk about that later, but there's also um, a long stand. Uh, with this, I can't remember what it's called now, and I haven't actually got the notes. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking for it myself, because I, uh, yeah, I, I, I tweeted about it. It looks really good because it's, uh, it's a stand that you can drag around with you. But basically the idea is that you have your iPad completely hands-free. So it's um, a sort of long slender stand with, with like a three-foot arm that you can actually move backwards and forwards to, you know, sort of position <laughs> the iPad in front of you and then bend it around. It does look a little bit too big, I have to say, and it's not cheap. But uh, it, it does uh, bring you a solution for hands-free for the iPad. Ah, yeah. Wish I, I wish I could find it in my Twitter feed right now. Uh, but yeah, there is a. It's it, it's. I think it's called the sale, or and some clever clever spelling of it. S e s e a h. Some oldie worldie sort of spelling of it. And it actually looks like the. <laughs> it looks like the yard arm of a sail of of of, of, a, of a schooner or something. Where when it's when it's uh, on, it's on your bedroom wall, it just simply folds flat. You drop this pole down. It brings <laughs> down this like cord that's that's like a lead a, 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 a lead and also there's a sheet that looks like a sail that acts as a cradle for the ipad so you can then just like lie back and have this thing hovering in front of your face uh, like some sort of caliph <laughs> expecting to have grapes dropped into his mouth only it's pages out of the book uh, i'm so I, I really would like to recommend i really would like to recommend it maybe during the commercial i'll, I'll search for it some more so i can uh, give people the uh, the actual actual place to go get it. Uh, for now, let's move on uh, to... Now, I think I should get uh, credit for not inviting rumors of what the next iPhone is going to be like. That was a hell of an opening, and my primary responsibility as host is to create those new ir irrational, irresponsible rumors that give us things to talk about for the next four or five weeks. Uh, Apple TV is still the rumor that would not die. Uh, we don't need to go to another three-hour discussion about, well, it doesn't make sense to me. Why would they have a TV set instead of an Apple TV that cost $99? I have to admit that I kind of got turned around a little bit uh, when I reminded myself on Amazon that there are actually lots and lots of TVs, 55-inch uh, TVs that sell for $1,500. It's not like that's like the premium, oh, God, there's only one, and you have to be, it's made out of mm. solid gold, and it's made out of <laughs> dragon tears, solid, solidified dragon tears for the remote. So I, can't, I couldn't see Apple making an $800 TV. I could definitely see them making something that costs twice as much as I would ever comfortably spend on a similar appliance. So I became a little bit more of a convert. Uh, but there was another 55 inches actually prophetic because a, another site, smarthouse.com, uh, the Australian site, uh, cites a Japanese source that there's going to be a 55-inch model and it's going to be using, and for the sake of uh, clarity, uh, what, what could be termed an iPad 3 process or whatever the next generation after the iPad 2 is going to be. Uh, do you think, uh, given that Apple is, in, is indeed in the business of selling really expensive things at high markup, is it a little bit more credible if we think about them just selling the really expensive one and not trying to compete with people who want to replace something for the rec room or the baby room? Let's start, well, let's well, start with. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say the, the, first, uh, the first goes to the bold. <laughs> We've got it. Anytime you want. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I was going to say, Adam, go right ahead. Usually. For those, of you who, for those of us who uh, um, have gone on the record numerous times as saying they don't watch television much, we finally, finally bought, broke down and bought our first television uh, in the last week or so um, since 1990. So uh, we, we upgraded past the, the Sony Trinitron from, you know, the 19-inch Sony Trinitron. And um, 
So it was fascinating seeing just how complicated it is to buy a TV. Um, it's, you know, there's vast numbers of features, even within manufacturer, there's mo many different models. Um, prices are not bad. Um, you know, that it, we actually, uh, there was a, we got a 50 inch Panasonic plasma for about $800 and to go to the 55 inch was, was, was 1100. So, you know, there's a, there's a spot there, which you could see Apple coming in at a higher price price range. But what I could mostly see Apple doing is simplifying that all of these things, all the decisions involved are very, very complicated. And you have to decide between LCD and plasma. And then when you're in LCD, there's the whole LED versus kind of compact fluorescent backlit nonsense. And it just, you know, it's one of those things where I felt like I was kind of qualified to do this as a tech writer, but, you know, I would not have wanted to see what someone who didn't have my background in hardware and electronics uh, attempt to do it. Um, and, you, you know, you go over to AVS forum and, and spend an evening reading stuff and, you know, your brain explodes. So uh, <laughs> it's just, it's a crazy, crazy world. And... But what, I, but what I still found interesting is we got this Panasonic Plasma, which, you know, it's an internet TV. It's almost impossible to get one that's not these days. I mean, I wanted a dumb monitor, but that's not available. And it does Amazon Instant Video. It does Netflix. It does Hulu Plus. It does YouTube. And it's pretty good. You know, it's, you know, it's kind of clumsy. Entering anything with the nine key remote is just <laughs> horribly awful. But the fact of the matter is that it actually works pretty well. And once you get it networked in and we don't have any other input to it, we have no antenna, no cable, no nothing, no, no, no DVD player, no, no game box, no, you know, no nothing. So it's just an internet TV and it works pretty well. So I actually could see Apple doing some of this sort of stuff now and, and coming in at that high end with, you know, the, the really cleanly designed, really simple to use system that would just work. Mm. Yeah, um, it was interesting. What, I, I, sorry, I don't remember who it was said it, though, but the, the thing that sort of swayed me, I know we've got all these rumors and, you know, we've, we've got the, the quotes in the book about uh, Steve Jobs finally figuring out how to do Apple TV. But I think, and again, I can't um, quote my source, I can't remember who said it, but, but basically what they said was, but, you know, Apple, uh, currently most people have got an Apple TV, which is a great device and does give you access to lots of this functionality, but it's always relegated to, you know, port two, HDMI two, or it's a, it's a separate, it's an add-on to the TV. Whereas Apple really, with their sort of philosophy and the wanting to control the entire user experience, they don't want their device to be on port two. They want it to be on port <coughs> one. They want, you, they want you to drop you into the Apple experience as soon as you switch your TV on. And at that point, I thought, well, actually, yeah, I can, I can well imagine Apple wanting to do that. And, you know, I, I bought a TV, you know, six months ago, seven or eight months ago now. And um, it's a great TV, picture's fine. But it's so clunky, and uh, the, you know the actual operating system of the TV is horrible. Mm. When you actually get onto the TV, you know it's uh, you, you have to switch to something decent to you know to, to to make it to make it work nice. And as for the built-in applications, you know the uh, the implementation of YouTube and stuff like that, it's just awful. And so yeah, I, I, you know I agree with Adam. I think you know it's 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 ripe really for Apple to come in, simplify everything, and give people the Apple experience from when they switch on the TV not from when they switch on the TV and then switch across to another port. Yeah, I finally got around to hooking up a, a boxy box for review. And I, I love it for the range of features that it brings. If you want to access the greatest variety of services and you don't want to hook up an actual computer, uh, uh, standalone uh, Windows or Mac computer to the, to the screen, it's probably your best bet. But yeah, it's just, I'll, I'll connect to my sling box, my cable connection upstairs, and it I'll get the picture but no sound or the sound but no picture. The HBO Go app sometimes <laughs> works, sometimes doesn't. And that's just if, if I had actually paid money for this as opposed to getting a review unit for, for, uh, for a while to play with, I'd be pretty cheesed off. And maybe if all, hap all Apple has to do is make all this stuff really, really work or maybe a little bit to be snarky, make it work as well as it does on a $69 Roku uh, box <laughs> to actually make it work. But, uh, it's got iOS, so it's got that on its side. Chris, what do you think? Right. Yeah, I think that they have to do more. Or we, we, we're think, I, we're, I'm sorry, we're assuming that's going to run iOS. What else would it run? Yeah, well, I, I do think that it has to be more than the simplicity of a TV. But I agree with everybody that setting up your TV is complicated, you, particularly when you start adding AV units in there. But I think like Apple does, they have to fundamentally change how we think of this device, which is our television set. So one, it becomes an airplane device. 
so that you have your devices walking around with your iPhone or your iPad and you immediately have contact with your television and you don't have to set up anything complicated, just bang, go to the TV, yes it does. Um, content, well applications is the next thing, that it becomes a real live iOS device. Yes, there are things like on the new Roku box, you can put games on there, you can play Angry Birds with kind of this clumsy controller, well that's got to go. So instead, you have real apps, you can put real games on there that you can control with your iOS devices. And then there's content, and that's going to be the tricky part, because unlike in the music industry where they were desperate and they needed that lifeline that Apple threw them, the movie companies and the TV uh, studios and the carriers do not want Apple to succeed, particularly the carriers. Comcast does not want people to have a la carte viewing because then they can't sell you these overpriced plans that have a thousand stations that you never watch. What ideally Apple would do is provide us with what many of us have wanted for a long time, which is that a la carte experience where we don't have to have Comcast or Dish or DirecTV, but rather we have these seven channels that we watch routinely because we want live sports and news. But we also want to be able to have a Hulu-like experience without the commercials where we can just con access the content that we want. That would change the way we consume media, but I think there are too many very powerful forces behind it to, to allow that to happen. So I think content is going to still be a stumbling block for Apple. Yeah, I mean, it's what's good, what's good a box with if it's an empty box without anything really entertaining or with any, any nudity to fill it with. Uh, and on that note, let's go back to our our spokesperson, our our our, our beautiful spokesmodel, Leo Laporte, uh, with another message from our sponsor. This time from Smile Software. Over to you, Leo. Can't be there with you guys uh, this week. Um, Hope you're watching and enjoying our coverage from Paris. I did want to talk a little bit about, you know, Andy, you could have done this ad because I know you love this thing. I certainly do. I hope you use this. Text Expander from Smile. You don't know about Smile? Oh, you got to try Text Expander. It is amazing. I, um, I put it on. I just got a new uh, error. And, of course, the very first thing I install is Text Expander. Now, you can get it on the uh, website from Smile Software or you can get it in the App Store. Uh, and I actually, because I bought it on the App Store, I, I actually paid for it twice. I have it from, you know, I bought it from Smile Software. And then I do this all the time. The App Store, well, I thought I'll be easy. Then I can update and everything. So it, it was already in my uh, App Store. As soon as I got that new Air, I just said, install it. And it's there and installed now. What does it do? Uh, well, it basically saves you typing. It saves you a lot of typing. Anytime you've got repetitive things that you type, uh, emails, signatures, uh, addresses, standard paragraphs. Uh, with Text Expander, you create the, the text or graphics snippet. By the way, you can do graphics too. Some people use a, have a graphic of their signature, for instance, and use that. And then you type an abbreviation. So for my signature, it's SSIG. It's not something I would type normally. But whenever I type SSIG in any text field on my computer, it fills it in. If it's, a, if it's a graphic, it pastes the graphic in. Your snippet's in the document. Now, Text Expander has done that for years, but now in Text Expander 3, they've added some nice new features. Uh, there are form fill snippets. So the snippet will pause and let you add, you know, fill in a blank. So if you want to customize it with a name or an address or something, it'll just pause, wait for you, you type it in, and then it continues on. Uh, you can now, finally, I think this is really nice, use tab, return, enter, and escape keys in your snippet. That's something new. There's full support for Apple Script and Shell Script. It means this is very powerful. The script is run and the result is inserted. So you could do a calculation. You could, uh, I mean, there's, it, it, I don't know, let's say, um, let's say you have an inventory system. You could have, you could be typing, oh, well, we only have X number left. You type, we only have X number left. And then when it fills it in, it will run a Shell Script or an Apple Script that determines how much is left and stick it in there. That's just one example of it. Uh, Dropbox support. I've been using this for a while. So I have my snippets not stored locally, but stored on Dropbox so that I have my snippets everywhere, which is really handy. Uh, also, hotkey options for quickly creating, editing, and finding snippets. I mean, I can just go on and on. This product gets better all the time. It is fantastic. There's a free demo waiting for you. Uh, you go to smilesoftware.com slash MacBreak, and you can try it free. It's thirty four ninety five, uh, which is a great deal, and I'm telling you, well worth it. 
Smilesoftware.com slash MacBreak. Try it free if you don't believe me. I would just go out and buy it. <laughs> In fact, Don McAllister has a great uh, screencast if you want to see it on the website, smilesoftware.com. And he'll walk you through all of the uh, benefits. Merlin's done it, too. Merlin, I, maybe it was Merlin who told me about Text Expander first. He's got a great demo uh, of the fill function, the, the form fill functionality on his uh, website, kungfugrip.com. Uh, In any event, everybody agrees. This is the pro the, one of, the, one of the, like, the five every Mac owner must have. If you don't have it yet, smilesoftware.com. Slash Mac break. Give it a try. Text expander from Smile. It'll make you smile. Now, speaking <coughs> of smiling, here's Mr. Ukulele star himself, Andy and not go. I'm sorry. That's my stage name, and I told you that in confidence, Leo. <laughs> yes, no, 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 no wonder Don has a screencast about text expander. Here, I, I have a travel pack of Q-tips here. I bet you have a screencast about this as well. If it's if it's translucent <laughs> or any way nifty, you've got a screencast about it. You are you are you are you are like smog. You cover the earth <laughs> in, in screencasts only in a positive way. We should have mentioned in the earliest uh, um, story as well about the redacted PDF. I bet you they didn't use PDF Pen because that would have sorted it out properly for them. Because that's another Smile product, and they have full redaction product. support in the PDF Pen product. There you go. All good um, stuff. All good stuff. Um, we're going to get to our iOS tips and our macOS tips. But first, uh, a shout-out for people in the New York metro area. The Grand Central Station Apple Store opens on Friday at 10 a.m. This is going to be the world's very largest Apple Store at 23,000 square feet. Uh, the second largest is now 16.3 thousand square feet at Covent Garden, which proves that the United States must be better than England if we have a larger Apple Store, because bigger things are better things. That's the American way of life. Look at our food portions. You wouldn't say that French food is better than American food because French portions are so tiny. Uh, yes, they've got the whole top floor there where a failed restaurants once was. Uh, so if you show up early enough, there's a good chance that uh, uh, Apple employees will applaud you. Uh, and in these tough times of desperation. It's good to have someone applaud you just for showing up and maybe buying something. Uh, they might get a free t-shirt if previous store openings are a lesson. Uh, it's not at coolness. It's not uh, 10 a.m. is just the special opening day for Friday. Uh, normally it's going to be open at 7 a.m. so I can catch all that commuter traffic coming in. Uh, it is not going to be open all night. It closes at 9 p.m. every day. So you hobos out there uh, are out of luck. I'm not talking, I'm ta I'm not talking about our unfortunate uh, homeless people. I'm talking about you hobos out there who spend your entire day mooching free Wi-Fi wherever you can get it, going from place to place to place. Uh, as, as when the Chipotle says, I'm sorry, it's time to move on, you move on to the Panera. When the Panera says you've had eight free refills, it's time to move on. Now you can go to the Apple Store. But you have to get out of there by 9 p.m., at which point you're on your way to the Starbucks, I'm sure. Now, uh, Adam, you live in New York State, so I'm sure that you're really <laughs> interested in this and that you're headed out there right now. It's what the... Uh, technically, when, when you convert it, you're on like... 8,031st Street uh, on the MTA line. <laughs> they get, you know it's like two tokens for you. You know that famous New Yorker cartoon where, you know, it's, you know, it's Midtown and, you know, and up to the Bronx and just sort of works its way. I'm somewhere next to California. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Five hours well, away, like, other world. <laughs> well, I suppose, well, but you're still in the same state. I mean, that's got to count for something. <laughs> New York's a big state. It, well, you know, we, it's one of those things... You don't you don't realize it until you try to drive across it the long way, and uh, you know it takes a while. I mean, there's other, I'm not saying New York's the biggest state or anything like that, but it's not one of those states that you just sort of jaunt across, like say Rhode Island, where you can <laughs> miss it if you're not careful and paying attention. Well, most New England states, you could miss it if you were to fall asleep at the wheel, which is something that you know. Well, actually, you, you, New Yorkers wouldn't do that because they have to stop to pee on something. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but why, why would you want to, on behalf of welcome another new sponsor, the New England Tourism Board, why would you want to pass by such wonderful states as the Green Mountain State, Vermont, the Granite State, New, New Hampshire, Maine, Blueberry State, Boston, home of, we've had three sitcoms, two of them were successful, don't matter the third <laughs> one, Doesn't not really our responsibility. Uh, but yeah, I mean... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Ithaca <laughs> is at. Uh, sorry, I'm looking, looking, looking Ithaca for, is look, known as centrally isolated. Centrally isolated. Yes, it's so convenient to all the other places that you would want to go if you want to get away from New York. Uh, we have to drive an hour in any direction to get to a to get to a freeway. <laughs> oh man, that's that's tough. So, well, on the on the other hand, if someone really wants to like argue with you in person, that's got 
Well, the good the good news is that they're probably not going to want to bother. The bad news is that if they want to bother, they're going to be really mad at you. They got to <laughs> really they're 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 ready to punch you pretty hard. Uh, but <laughs> it, it, it's I was looking I was looking at the Grand Central as usual. The entire area is draped off in in black curtains. There is a couple of sneak photos that have been taken of the Genius Bar that preserve. Obviously, they couldn't tear anything down and really do a whole lot of construction considering it's a historic area. So they've done things like hang glass panels in front of the, the stonework uh, to put all the really cool tech and all the cool logos on. So I don't know if that's going to be as architecturally incredible as the giant glass cube is or, or the giant glass tube or the giant glass DNA helix uh, that's planned for the 33,000 uh, uh, 33, square foot Apple store destined for Brainerd uh, in what, 2013, 2014? They always got to keep building them bigger and bigger. Uh, yeah, I just thought it's 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 cool they're making them larger. It's cool they're putting in such a central location. I mean, if I were a daily commuter, I would. <laughs> the good the good news is that I would be buying my. I have my iPhone, and every time that it overheated and exploded in my pocket, at least I I couldn't get my jacket fixed for the smoking holes uh, to be patched up. But I at least can get a new battery uh, in that place. I don't know if it's gonna really catch. I don't I don't I don't I don't know how excited people should be about it. Uh, I'm really curious to see how they're gonna build uh, how the, what how they solved all those problems of building a really cool store in a space that's so significant where they're they, you think that it's tough you, you rent your first apartment you can't hang a picture where you want imagine trying to create a place where you can put your your, your 23 square foot uh, giant interactive ipad when there's a arts commission already they're getting into trouble uh, the new york post was claiming that apple got a sweetheart deal uh, for the eight hundred thousand dollar a year uh, rent on the space uh the legislators who had a part of that deal were claiming that, oh, well, you know what? They also had to pay off $5 million to the previous tenant to get the space. And the people who were complaining were saying, yeah, but that money didn't actually go to the city, did it? Uh, so, so, so that's a, that's a good lawsuits come in threes, and we've had our three lawsuits so far, uh, three legal actions, uh, and now we are ready to move. Unless anybody has any comments or questions or or quips or anecdotes about hanging out in Grand Central Station and standing up for four hours uh, just to get a free T-shirt and maybe a look at an iPad too that you've owned for three months. Nope. Excellent. Uh, so let's go. <laughs> are they going to give out the little Apple train whistles or something? It's kind of your to go with your T-shirt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, woo -woo. That, and a little engineer's cap. <laughs> you, should, you should do that. You should, you should be Conductor Chris. Hello. <laughs> I'm here to punch your ticket to new iOS understanding. All now, that would be so cool. But... The potential of GarageBand on iOS. Exactly. I mean, forget the whole orange T-shirt and the blue T-shirt thing. Put everybody in stripy overalls and the engineer's cap and give them a little punchy <laughs> thing. And, you know, and that's how you check out instead of scanning through some app. You know, just go in there with like, a, you know, with $20 bills and you just punch them and take them away from them and say, and here you, here's your thing. That, that's a great that's a great idea, because the one thing that's always been missing from the Apple Store experience are employees who wish they were dead. Uh, and if you force right. them to wear these embarrassing uniforms and force them to say, welcome to the Apple Store, Grand Central Station. <laughs> woo, woo, call aboard for great savings on holiday. Please kill me right now. <laughs> I'll get on the phone with Ron Johnson right now and see if I can there make you that go. happen. <laughs> uh, so let's actually, since, since, we, since we have you on the line right now, Conductor oh. Chris, what is your iOS tip of the week? Woo, woo. Okay, my iOS tip is... Uh, and some of yours out there. Don't go ahead. I'm, I'm, we're doing the background. We're because we're we're on the learning train. We're approach. We're not at the station of understanding yet, but we're approaching it. We're getting faster. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fine. Right. So uh, you said you're going to play along with that. You said you're going to every time I do this, you're going to play along. You're not playing along, but that's fine. That's fine. Okay. I'm, I'm that's sorry. Fine. I'm go, no. Go ahead. Do the train. It, it's a good tip. I've read it. Uh, it's like I, I had one of those like duh moments where I. Thought that if I were a smarter, if I were a higher life form, I would have figured out this out myself, but I had not. So it's going to be valuable. It's, it's okay. just not going to be enhanced by immersive sound effects that would have <laughs> sold it so much better. But if you think <laughs> the idea is good enough in and of itself, if you want to take that responsibility onto yourself, Chris, you're a better okay. man than I. So by all means, everybody, here is the genius tip that doesn't need any enhancement whatsoever. We're all watching. <laughs> Thanks. No pressure. Anything in? Yeah, no pressure. And, and I mean, that's particularly bad because this, to a lot of people, they're going to go, well, duh. 
But <laughs> some people will find this helpful. I did because I didn't go, well, I went, oh, well, of course I should have thought of that. And I got this from Dan Frakes at Macworld. So if you think it's stupid, you can email him and say, well, that's the dumbest tip I ever heard. Uh, and the idea is that um, you know that you can create folders on these things. And when you do, it's so helpful that you have your folders full of applications. But oftentimes what we end up doing is we'll drag an app over and we'll create a folder. And then when we do that, that's all wonderful. Except then what we do is we tend to like swipe to another page and then we grab an app and then we drag it over here and we wait for the screen maybe to respond as it's supposed to, but most of the time it snaps back and you try again and please go over there and finally it moves and then you can drag it into your folder. But the folder keeps moving back and forth on the screen and you can't get to it. So here's the tip. Take your folder and put it down in the dock. And when you put it down in the dock, then you can switch all the screens you like and just simply drag them down into the folder, add them to the folder. That way, when you're finished with that folder, drag it out, create another folder, put it down in the dock, move between pages, and drag your apps into the folder. And again, uh, yes. Now, Chris, you sure you weren't reading Tanya's Take Control of Your iPad book? Because that tip is right in there. I, you know, there might be some, some tip plagiarism here going on. Wow. Well, you know, you're going to have to talk to Dan Frakes about that, but I <laughs> admire the way you slipped that plug in for yeah, your, your yeah, wife's yeah. book. And, and I know you get a piece of this, so, but uh, don't, don't, no, hey, nicely done. I get more than a piece. It's my wife. <laughs> really? Well, that also points. happens to be in my new iPhone uh, pocket guide book from oh, Peach see, Press, which is highly affordable. <laughs> <laughs> Available at popular prices at gas stations everywhere. <laughs> right. Don, you have, a, you have a Mac OS tip for us today. Yeah, do I get any sound effects or? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. no, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. All right. So mission control. <laughs> oh, sorry. And lion. Soothing sounds of the sea? No? Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. No. <laughs> well, tumbleweed might be. No, no, no. Uh, mission control for lion 10.7.2. Um, with lion and with mission control, we now have these desktops or spaces that you can uh, create just by moving your cursor up to the top right hand corner of the screen. And in Mission Control, you get a new desktop. Now, in the first version of Line, it was, it was great, but you couldn't reorder them. So it uh, wasn't too useful. But now with 10.7.2, you can actually reorder the arrangement of your spaces within Mission Control and also your full screen apps as well. So that's good in itself. But you can also now create keyboard shortcuts to jump, jump directly to desktops or spaces. And you do that through system preferences. Go into keyboard, go into keyboard shortcuts, and then under Mission Control, you'll see for every new desktop you create in Mission Control, there'll be a switch to desktop and then a numeric. So uh, if you create a new desktop, you get a new entry in there. Just go in and you can add a, a um, assign a keyboard shortcut to that and then you can just do Control 1, Control 2, Control 3 and jump to all your different desktop spaces. You can't jump to a full screen app, I don't think, but you can certainly jump to all the different desktops or spaces that you create. <laughs> Excellent. Now, we all have picks of the week lined up, I hope. If we do not have a pick of the week, you have probably about four or five minutes to line one up because we have an ad from Audible before we get to the picks of the week. And here I have to hand it over to uh, our spokesperson, Andy Notko. Thanks, Andy. Doing a hell of a job back there in the studio. Welcome to Paris, which I wasn't invited, even though the rest of the cool people from Twitter seem to be right there now. But that's okay. Uh, I have to. I have to. They've got some. I've got some sophisticated ad copy that I have to now read in my professional voice. This episode of MacBreak Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of audiobooks with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. For listeners of Mac Break Weekly, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their service. Uh, we one audiobook. Well, I will give you the. We'll give you the URL for that as soon as I make my pick. Um, Today was uh, today's my audible pick for today was something that I chose, believe it or not, just this afternoon uh, because uh, uh, <laughs> John Hodgman, as you know, is the the, the formerly I think he's he's, he's expunged his uh, his his nomenclature as he is the the American I'm a Mac guy. He's he's now a responsible commentator, Daily Show contributor, and uh, humorist and essayist in his own right. We need not 
associate him with uh, the Mac anymore. Uh, and he has a really great podcast uh, called Judge John Hodgman, in which actual, just like people, it's just like the People's Court only via Skype, where people who have a, a dispute of some kind can put it before Judge John Hodgman, uh, and live via Skype, he will educate this and and, and create uh, his ruling. Today's ruling was a uh, couple, boyfriend and girlfriend. The boyfriend has a habit of rummaging through the trash, uh, the, 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 the trash barrels at this local pizza place where there's like some sort of in-store promotion where there's like a tear off on uh, some of the pizza boxes have a free prize coupon attached. And sometimes people forget to look for them and they throw out a free slice, a coupon for a free slice of pizza or whatever. And the guy says, well, it's free pizza. Why would I to, where would I pass that up? The girl is actually quite horrified that his boy, her, her boyfriend is doing that right there in the, in the middle of a pizza place. Only the wisdom and the, the, and the legal acumen of Judge John Hodgman can do that. Uh, and so I was looking for a way to get more John Hodgman into my life without actually uh, paying his speaking fee, which unfortunately is far beyond my means as a journalist. Uh, and so uh, I wound up uh, downloading more information than you require, which is uh, his second book in this trilogy of almanacs of information about everything that you would ever want to know about everyone everywhere on all topics. Most, some of it is made up, but most of it is actually uh, quite useful. Uh, and the cool thing about it is that it is read by John Hodgman, so you can't really go far wrong there. Uh, I just downloaded it like in the hour before <laughs> I, before we started recording. I listened to just the first like 20 minutes as I was setting up and I'm like, yeah, this was, this was a good purchase. It's uh, 12, I, I, I haven't for a while mentioned how long certain uh, uh, certain selections are. I am of course a favor of uh, if you're using this as your free, free download, the free download you get to keep even if you cancel uh, your membership with Audible. This is weighing it at 12 hours and 48 minutes. Uh, so it is a a very, very good candidate if you're up to, uh, if, if you if you really want to just sort of, you know, stick it to the man, if you were to define the man as audible, even though they're being nice and giving you a free audiobook, I don't think that's quite appropriate uh, at this time. But, uh, and so that is thanks to Audible. Uh, thank you for uh, sponsoring the show. Thank you for having a great service. Again, I, I blow through uh, too many audiobooks in the course of a year. Uh, it actually makes me allow myself to try to bamboozle my way into thinking, making people think I actually read more books than I actually do. I don't actually read. Sometimes I'm just sort of doing the housework while I'm listening to a cool book. All thanks to audible.com. And now let's move on to our picks of the week. I will reserve the last slot of the pick of the week for myself so that if any of you want to scoop me and steal my pick, by all means, go ahead. That's part of the, uh, that's part of the problem of being uh, the host, that we are the last. We always get the fuzzy under the lollipop. Uh, but let's start off with Chris. What is your pick this week? All right. This week I am uh, offering to all of you a digital strip show in a way. And uh, here is my... Here's my iPhone. <laughs> right, more sound effects. Okay, not so interesting, but check out the back. Ooh. Ooh. It's see-through. You can He's see. He's a sorcerer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yes, you can see the guts. Here's the battery, and here's stuff that does things with my phone. And this is my iPhone 4S. And this is thanks to iFixit and their $30 iPhone 4S transparent back Rear glass panel, 30 bucks. Um, they go in and out of stock. So if you were to dash over there right now, they might not be in stock, but I have talked to the people who run the joint and they say that indeed they are getting stock in every day. So if they're out, check back again in uh, you know, half a day or so. Um, with it comes not only the, the panel in the back, but also two tools that you can use to take off the screws. Now, Apple has changed the screw arrangement on these things so that they use a proprietary screw to put in, to affix the back panel to this. They include the two tools, the proprietary tool for getting the old screws out, and they give you nice Phillips head screws to put back in so that should you wish to get back in and you've lost that tool, you can just take it out with a Phillips head screwdriver. It's sturdy. It's got the little lens thing for your camera. It's got the diffuser for the flash. It comes in uh, models for both the 4S as well as the iPhone 4. It's 30 bucks again. Not everybody in the world needs this, but I just think it's really cool to be able to look in and see the guts of my iPhone. Plus, I gave my iPhone 4 to my wife, and when they were sitting next to each other on a table, 
I would have to take both of them and look side by side and go, now where's that antenna line? Okay, this is my phone. I don't have that problem anymore. Now I just pick up the phone, look at it and go, ah, I see the guts, this is my phone. And that's my pick. Super and magical, two things we like to see with everything that we have in our iOS world. Adam, what's your pick of the week? Well, my pick of the week is uh, is not something anything new. Um, and in fact, it's for people who are who are in some ways trying to avoid the new. Um, it's BusyMax BusyCal, which is the iCal replacement that uh, does many things better than iCal. In fact, I I think it may in fact do everything better than iCal. Um, keep in mind that I really really hate iCal, and and. The thing that BusyCal does uh, particularly well that um, causes me to p give it as my pick of the week is that, um, dirty little secret here, not all of my Macs are on Lion. Uh, some of them can't be upgraded. Some of them, some of them can't be upgraded past Leopard, for that matter. And uh, others of them, I just haven't gotten around to it. I'm, I'm a busy guy. I just can't do everything all at once. And yet, I wanted to move to iCloud and keep shared calendars. Um, we get some household tension when the calendars stop being shared and conflicts start occurring. So, so in any event, so I wanted to uh, upgrade to iCloud and uh, keep the calendars shared with Tanya, uh, who had upgraded her stuff to iCloud. And uh, I was really worried that I wasn't going to be able to do that easily unless I could, you know, do some funkiness with BusyCal. And then I did the upgrade, and BusyCal in Leopard and Snow Leopard just does iCloud. It's I, I, I should have realized this. I, I, it just built in. It just works. It just picks it up. <laughs> Nothing about it. iCloud just works. So that's, that's quite an achievement if that's true. It does. It just works. Awesome. On one of my Macs, I didn't even have to enter my credentials again. Another one I had to go and sign into <laughs> iCloud. But I was, I was literally flabbergasted. I, I had to write this. I was sort of prepping to write this big, long article about how I'd followed all the instructions and Joe's take control of iCloud on the BusyCal site and everything like that. And I'd freaking off this weird, hacky way of getting it to work. <laughs> and uh, then it just worked on its own. So I wrote the article <laughs> saying how it just worked, and I was a little embarrassed. So, but uh, kudos to BusyMac for making that possible. Uh, now, if they would just get around to doing something to replace address book, I hate address book almost as much as I hate iCal. <laughs> yeah, there's a certain gentrification that needs to occur deep, deep, deep in the corners of Mac OS at this point. <laughs> Don, what's your pick? Well, I've got 42 applications. So if you've got, if you've got time, I'll start off with the first one. No, I won't actually go through one, <laughs> one by one. It's, it's that season of the year again. Actually, I'm, I'm not sure if they do this every year. I know in spring we normally get all these bundles come out, but they've now decided to do winter bundles. So there are four bundles that I'm aware of. There's probably more, uh, but some of them are really, really good. And basically, I'll just read out the four URLs. There's MacLegion.com, there's MUPromo.com, ProductiveMax.com, and also BundleHunt.com. Now, um, some great apps, and actually, if you check out ProductiveMax.com, you might find something to your advantage, because uh, I think, uh, yes, look at that. <laughs> Up on the top shelf. Two, oh, it's busy, Cal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, yeah, that, and that is a great deal, actually. That's got six of my favorite applications in that particular bundle, Productive Max. The thing with these bundles is if you can get at least two or three applications out of each bundle, for the, and then they're normally round, I think the Productive Max one is uh, 39, the others are all 49. If you can get three really good applications out of each bundle, you're doing really well. So uh, there's, there's four to choose from. Um, you know, just go in, have a look, and uh, see what you think. But that Productive Max one is a particularly good one for thirty nine ninety nine, and that includes BusyCal as well. And LaunchBar. Love LaunchBar. And Bar. LaunchBar. Yeah, no, totally love there. LaunchBar. Default yeah. Folder you're, X as well, another one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it really is like the Kellogg's Variety Pack when you have these bundles, where so long as it, it's okay that there's an all-brand, it's okay if there's like that sort of all mixed of corn and fish meal that no one wants. As long as you get your Fruit Loops, as long as you get your Lucky Charms, as long as you get, you know, the ones that you want, it's still very much a bargain. As long as you get the the the, the, the ones you want at prices that are far far less than retail. Yeah, it used to be as well that people were very suspicious of bundles and used to think, oh well, you know, we're doing the developers out of the the, the you know the, the the full retail price. But you know, I think it's at the point now whereby it's a standard thing now. Developers do enjoy and get benefit from being part of these bundles so you know um, people who buy software shouldn't really be too worried about that aspect of yeah. it and uh, you know take advantage of it while it's there you feel better because now that these bundles are more of a known quantity if a developer enters an agreement that doesn't work for themselves they could have asked around with people who had already oh, done sure. these bundle deals so you know that sure. they can go in a lot more better informed than they could a few years ago when these bundles first uh, started popping up
<laughs> well, uh, I have a non-pick and an actual pick. Uh, the That really cool uh, iPad stand that hangs out from the wall that looks like a sail is called the... I don't know how to pronounce this. What is the typographical symbol where you have the A and the E mushed together? Well, let's call that the Schmengi. <laughs> you spell it M Schmengi S T two. It's the Mast two. Fortunately, if you actually just simply Google for Mast two M A S T space two, you will find the right Kickstarter project for it. Uh, this is just this is just a this is just simple marketing. When you pick a name, make sure it doesn't yeah. it doesn't have an unpronounceable character that cannot be spelled or typed. Uh, that's just, you know, Prince. There's a reason why Prince is now called Prince again, because people <laughs> figured out that, you know what, we don't have a key for that thing that you've just given us. So tell you what, we're just going to re-review the latest Michael Jackson album instead of yours. because It's just simpler. We have there are a limited number of hours in the day. Uh, it is a Kickstarter project. They are on their way. They've got $482 of the 740 they need. They need 12 people uh, to pledge... One dollar or more for sixty bucks, you get a handmade mast. Uh, if you are not in the United States of America, you pay an extra twenty-five bucks. But it looks pretty cool. Uh, the the only the I just wish that there were an easy way to like mount it next to like in a shower stall enclosure because you do have to drill holes to get it in. It's all, it's made out of wood and steel. So really, what you want is that for just that sort of lazy bathtub action. But oh well, can't be perfect. But still, looks, I think you'll agree it looks pretty cool. My actual pick of the week. Uh, is uh, has a triple threat feature for it. It's called Sky Safari 3. And uh, Sky Safari is one of those legendary iOS apps that is just extremely well done and gives you brings you a brand new view of things that you've already seen before. Uh, how many times have you been... Uh, I've got, actually got it here on the screen behind me. Uh, how many times have you just like been in the backyard and you're having one of those times when you realize that, gosh, when I was younger, I was able to spot all of these constellations and I knew what I was looking at in the, in the sky. I should have set this up a little better, but now you can see some of that. Uh, so I've, got the, I've got it running on the iPad right now. Uh, and really all it does is it gives you a view of the entire sky in front of you as it would appear to you. It uses loca location information and also knows, you know, obviously what, what day and what time it is. So it knows that if you're looking in this direction, northeast, you should be able to see Perseus. Uh, so you can then just sort of just tap on Perseus to get a look at that constellation and just tap on, zoom, tap on that. And we'll actually give you more information about the constellation, all the stars that are built into it. Right now I'm highlighting uh, individual stars. You can zoom in uh, to get all, the, uh, get all the star information. Here's uh, what's, oh, there you go. I'll just tap on info. There you go. And it's just, it's like having a pair, of, it's like having an astronomer next to you who will show you exactly all the cool stuff that's around you. This is the, it's available for, it's a, uh, Unified from uh, app, it will work on both uh, your iPhone and your iPad. Uh, if you uh, it's normally two ninety nine, it's actually on sale for ninety nine cents through the eighth, uh, December eighth, which is forty percent off. Uh, excuse me, which is uh, two thirds off. Uh, also, forty percent of the purchase price goes to a good cause, Astronomers Without Borders. You go to astronomerswithoutborders.org. Uh, they are it's a educational uh, organization that basically sends astronomers out to educate people, educate kids about <laughs> astronomy and the, and the known world. Uh, it's a really cool, it's a really cool app, really fun to play with, really cheap and goes to a really good cause. So we got a triple threat of goodness and elegance there. So that is my pick of the week. Chris Breen of Macworld.com, thank you so much for being part of our little hootenanny today. Even if you didn't want, well, I, I can understand that you don't want, you, you, the perfection of your iOS instruction or in tutorial is so good that it doesn't require like phony studio effects. As a musician yourself, you know that when you see the auto-tune kick in, it's not because the person was so good a singer that they decided to make it even better. It was because they were crummy and needed enhancement. You need no such enhancement. Uh, where can people go to find more of the Chris Breen elegance, precision, beauty, and wisdom? Well, of course, you can go to macworld.com slash mac911 for my mac911 tips and troubleshooting column. The iPhone 4S Pocket Guide has just come out this week from Peach Pit Press. And okay. lynda.com has my video training as well. Excellent. Don McAllister, we've already plugged your your, seri your, your, your screencast <laughs> as well we should uh, because, wow. again, Voluminous, uh, I, did, I did not see the screencast of how to use this travel flip-top uh, Q-tip dispenser, uh, but I'm sure that you're working on that. Maybe you're making a special flight out because this isn't available to you in the UK. Uh, where can people go for more Don McAllister nougaty goodness? 
I'll certainly put that on the list. Well, you can go across to screencastonline.com and learn about becoming a Screencast Online member. Actually, there's still, um, there's still a, a discount coupon for MacBreak Weekly. You can get 50% off uh, membership by using the coupon code MacBreak Weekly. And uh, that's it. You can find me on the Twitter as Don McAllister. Oh, you can also find my um, SEO Tutor app in the Mac App Store, which is a, a tutorial all about learning about Lion. And uh, that's available in the Mac App Store, SEO Tutor for Lion. And I, I don't suppose you would know off the top of, the, off the, off the top of your head how many five-star reviews you have had on that app. That's just ridiculous for me to ask that question because you wouldn't know. Prox, uh, well, uh, 140 <laughs> odd. I don't know exactly. But oh, is that all? Years. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, 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 we'll, maybe we'll, if we give you this edit exposure, you'll actually get some, some happy customers for that, for that product. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, I think two star reviews, though. So. <laughs> bastards. Bastards. I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> Adam is the Charles Foster Kane of digital publish digital Mac <laughs> publishing, only without the voluminous problems. Adam, please plug away it's as if everybody here does not understand where to find tidbits and your your online <laughs> initiatives. Yeah, every now and then someone says, hey, "What's your email address?" And I'm like, "You can't find it, really? <laughs> um, really? You you are you are you are you, you've been you've been on the internet so long. Your URL is like l dot com." <laughs> yes. Actually, uh, we've been on the internet so long that we had tidbits.uucp. So, uh, you know, the dot com was one of those newfangled things that we added on later. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so tidbits.com is where you can go to find everything we write in tidbits, a uh, free weekly uh, email newsletter that uh, we fill up with goodness throughout the week and then push out via email for those people who just like getting it old school uh, on Monday evenings. And then uh, takecontrolbooks.com is where we publish all of our Take Control ebooks. Uh, just uh, managed to finish off Tanya's Take Control of Your iPad and Joe Kissel's Take Control of Mail on the iPad, iPhone, and iPod Touch. Um, third edition, so got that out, and uh, we're actually working hard to get take control of iCloud 1.1. Get an update to that out. Uh, people have been having all sorts of issues with iCloud, and uh, Joe is the, well, as far as I know, the foremost expert on uh, what to do about that. Excellent. Yeah, I've been, I've been having my own little stressed out problems with iCloud recently. It's 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 like that tango partner keeps stepping on your feet, but she smells so good you keep dancing with her anyway. <laughs> I am, of course, the tech columnist of the Chicago Sun Times. You can read my stuff at suntimes.com. If you can spell my last name, you can also find me on anatgo.com or anatgo on Twitter. If you cannot spell my last name, that's okay. My own dad when wasn't able to spell my last name. It was his last name too. I really think it was a spite issue as opposed to a spelling issue. You can actually <laughs> Actually, go to cwob.com for the Celestial Waste of Bandwidth, which will give you links to all of the above. That covers it for this week. Mac break has broke. Morning has spoken. Break time is over. Now get back to work, you gold bricks. If you got time to lean, you got time to clean. It's a down economy, you know. We can replace you like that, like that.